Hey, hey, what's up, y'all? Welcome to Lawns Across America, episode 33. All right, I'm going to get to this one pretty quick here because I don't have the music only for that one. So we're just going to jump in today. And actually, I'm going to spend most of this podcast just answering straight questions for those who called in at 833 Tips. 833 Tips is where you can leave your questions and possibly get those answered on the podcast. I will say we have about 40 questions already built up. So if I haven't gotten to yours yet, it doesn't mean I don't like you or I'm not going to get to it. I might very well get to it. Or sometimes the weather passes. You were asking me a weather-related question. The weather passes and I don't get to you, so I'm sorry about that. As well as sometimes the questions are just ones that I just don't know the answer to because I don't know everything. But I will say that today we are going to start out, and I want to talk to my warm season friends. I've been seeing a little bit of a trend across the interwebs over by there. A couple people will ask questions in different private forums that I'm in or Twitter or on my Facebook page or whatever. And they'll say, Hey, got such and such fertilizer. Can I throw it down? And I, a lot, I immediately see people coming in and they're saying, no, it's too hot. No, don't throw it down. No, it's too hot. And I want to caution you all with that because when somebody asks me, Hey, you know, I've got such and such fertilizer. Can I throw it down? My first question always is what is your grass type? And I think we need to start thinking that way. And that's why I talk in this podcast, I talk to warm season and cool season, because I'm hoping that you'll listen to both sides of it and you'll learn and you'll be a better lawn care nut because you understand the difference in the grass type. So I want to go ahead and go over this right now because warm season folks, now is your time to shine. Now is your time to throw her down, boys. Let's hope for the best because you are in your peak party time. I'm going to put up, if you're on YouTube, I'll put up the growth calendars. I was pointing to the wrong side. I'll put up the growth calendars over here and you'll see cool season lawns. It's two camel humps, right? Cool season lawns. The times when you are throwing down, the times when you're pushing your lawn, those are the spring and the fall. That is when your cool season lawn will do it. Most of it's putting in roots and top growth and that's when it's going to look the best and that's when it's going to get the thickest. And you have to really bomb it. That's why in springtime, I'm encouraging you guys, hammer that lawn, baby. Put that nitrogen in. Nitrogen drives the bus yeehaw cowboy and then when you get to summer you chill out and and of course if your lawn is not dormant i haven't looked at the weather this week around the country so i don't know if we're still in the 90s or not i'm a little behind on that but if you're still in the 90s then you're either limping your lawn along with spoon feeding of nitrogen and higher potash things like that that's cool season lawns and you're watering or or if your lawn has gone dormant or it's struggling you're not really fertilizing at all but warm season you can see we are in our peak party time. And in fact, our camel hump is one big long one. So instead of really bombing the lawn so much, what we tend to do is put in good doses of fertilizer every 30 days. 30 days fertilizer, 30 days fertilizer, 30 days fertilizer. This time of year, you could use pretty much whatever you want. If you want to use Carbon X because you don't mind mowing a lot, you're going to get beautiful results at it. I put it down at the Freedom Factory getting ready for their last event that they had in June. And I had put it down leading up to that just before my furt bands came in. And I'll tell you what, we had that silvery blue color. Those of you that have used Carbon X, you know they get that silvery blue color that it produces. It's beautiful and it works really well. But you are going to have to mow a little bit more. But for those of you that are liking to keep things spoon feed, the 818 is a good choice. And again, I'm not going to go into all the different ideas here, all the different ferts here. Coming up this weekend, I will be recommending some store-bought fertilizer. So make sure you're subscribed over at the Lawn Care Nut. I'm going to take you through a couple two-tree secrets to look for when you're going over by the Home Depot over by there. A couple two-tree things you can look for. Because store-bought fertilizer is not bad at all. And in fact, I actually had a video this year that got like 1.1 million views in a month. And I was recommending a store-bought product in that video. So all of it works, you know. It's all what you want to eat. What do you want to eat today? So I'm not always eating organic broccoli. Sometimes I'm eating some, some ice cream, you know what I'm saying? So anyway, but warm season turf, I don't want you guys to think this is not your time. It is. So please be throwing down hard, man. Now, you got to be watering, of course. Everybody's got to be watering when it's 90, 95 degrees out no matter what your grass type is, but if you want your lawn to thicken up, if you're somebody that's got St. Augustine grass, Bermuda, for sure Bermuda, for sure Zoysia, 
Centipede, a little bit slower. A little different strategy there. But for sure, zoysia, Bermuda, and St. Augustine grass, if you want your lawn to get thicker, you need to be feeding it consistently every 30 days. Fertilizing. Good nitrogen, good potassium. If you have a phosphorus deficiency, that works too. So I just want you guys to know, warm season lawns, you are in it to win it right now. Throw down and keep throwing down. All right. With that, though, I'm going to get into some questions now. And uh, like I said, I promised you we're going to go right into them now. I got a couple that came in um, via email. I got a, a sad story one <laughs> of a guy that I helped. And then a bunch of questions that did come in over the 833 LCN tips line, as well as I have a couple songs to play. I like putting a little music in there over by there, back and forth. I think it just breaks up the monotony of it. And uh, it also allows me to use some footage that doesn't necessarily make it on the YouTube channel. I just kind of put that on there. Some of you guys enjoy watching that. So that is, of course, if you're on YouTube. All right, so here we go. Let's go into this. This comes from a gentleman named Spencer, and Spencer has Cool Season Turf, and he says, absolutely love the Instagram page and your blogs. By the way, if you don't follow me on Instagram, check it out over there, Alan Hain, A-L-L-Y-N-H-A-N-E. I have been doing Instagram content and video. I, I've let off that the last month here, but I've been trying to do one every two weeks. I do an Instagram video, but you, form, you film those in a taller and a vertical format, and they look really cool. I kind of like the way it looks. So you go over there, and I've been letting out some tips there, as well as that is where I really unleash the Chicago accent and uh, try to do an Instagram story every couple, two, three days over by there. Unless you guys know what's going on over here by a uh, LCNHQ. You got some behind-the-scenes stuff over there, stuff that don't make it on a YouTube channel, so you can see that over there. All right, so with that, though, he says, absolutely love the Insta page and your blogs. It's always great when there is some actual not forced comedy included in the people I follow. Well, thanks, bro. I'm hoping you could help out with some advice. I completely killed my back lawn last fall with glyphosate, laid down four to six inches of topsoil, and planted a high-quality turf-type tall fescue. Everything came in great and was looking good going into the summer, or I'm sorry, going into the winter here in Massachusetts. Well, it surprised me this spring I had large patches of poa annua. All right, so let me just catch you up here. So he burned his lawn down last year, seeded, everything came in good. And then this spring, as things started coming out, he got large patches of poa annua. Not sure if it was just dormant deep under the topsoil. Or he says, I'm not sure if it was just dormant deep under the ground or if my topsoil wasn't the quality I thought it was. Anyways, this spring, I did the same to the front yard, and although I had good germination, the crabgrass also came in. At this point, I'm just looking towards my late summer and fall plan. I've read a lot about tenacity strategy. Tenacity is a weed killer. And other pre-emergence, my initial strategy was to put down tenacity air rate overseed at the end of summer. I'm looking at purchasing your cool season plan and wondering if it covers that strategy. Okay, so let's go into this. So a couple things, and I'm going to have to do a little I told you so on this one, Spencer, and you you may not have seen this before, and probably a lot of people haven't, so I'm just going to say I do not recommend the lawn burn down. Uh, of course, my phone always rings. Hello, Alan. All right, back to it. So I'm going to say I do not recommend the lawn burn down. And what the lawn burn down is, for those of you that don't know, is people, for some reason, they don't like what's in their lawn. I am a fan of old school lawns. What an old school lawn is, is it's a lawn that's been in there for a long time, maybe 50, 60, 80 years. And it's a, it's, a, it's a hodgepodge of different grasses. Now, there may be some undesirables in there, and you can pick those out by hand or glyphosate those out one at a time. But for the most part, I like an old school lawn because those are the fighters. If that grass has been there for 40, 50 years, what that tell you? That tells you that's the seasoned grass. That's the wise grass. That's the grass that's made it through while all the others died. And sometimes you'll get older grass types or cultivars, I mean, that they're at, their seed is actually viable. Because just so you guys know, um, one of the big panics we get every spring is sometime in April, May, usually May into June sometimes, depending where you live, people will start seeing all these seeds in their lawn and their Kentucky bluegrass lawn or their turf-type tall fescue lawn, and they think it's weeds. But actually, it's just your grass going to seed. It's just its natural thing. The deal with that, though, is that that seed is not viable. It is sterile. And it's been bred that way. So... If you have an old school lawn, though, you may have some of that older grass that actually that seed can be viable, and that's pretty cool. And the idea there is, is that I recommend keep the old school lawn and just add the newer, fresher grass types cultivars to that to improve it over time. So keep building on a great foundation. OK, 
Okay, so that's my recommendation. And by the way, I think old school lawns look great. I think they look really nice. So that's my strategy there. But it looks like Spencer went ahead and did that burn down. And now what's happened is he got Poa annua that, that, hit, that invaded him in the spring. Now let me explain Poa annua to you. It's a fall germinating annual. And so what an annual is as opposed to a perennial is an annual means the seed grows. And in this case, it grows in the fall. It lives over winter. It grows really fast and hard all during the spring. And then summer, once it gets hot enough, probably over 85 degrees, the Poa annual will push seeds. The thing is, it pushes seeds about the same time or at a similar time that your good grass does. So you don't necessarily notice that. It drops those seeds and then it dies. That's an annual. It lives the one year. Another annual that he talked about here is crabgrass. Crabgrass has a different cycle. It germinates in the spring. It lives fast and hard all year. It drops seeds in the fall and dies. But either way, it's an annual. So let's go back to the Poa annua. So he burned his lawn down, brought in a ton of topsoil, seeded. The seed came in good, but also what came in along with it is Poa annua. So there's two choices or two ways that the Poa annua could have gotten in, and he's already identified that. It could be that he opened things up and that it was already laying dormant in the lawn. And I think that could be a possibility, especially if it's an older lawn. You guys got to realize that a good turf stand, even a thin turf stand, is your best defense against a lot of weeds because it crowds them out. It blots out the sun. It takes moisture. It ta and those seeds can be buried deep, and they can lay dormant for a long time. But when you open things up, when you burn things up, and you allow the sun to get deeper and the heat to get deeper and the water to get deeper, and you allow more space, you can awaken those aliens. It reminds me of a story. And uh, when I was in basic training in Lackland Air Force Base in uh, the fall of 1993, we all had to get our heads shaved. It's one of those things they do when you enter the military. And uh, it's kind of interesting because none of us had ever seen our heads bare. <laughs> you know, you're 18 year old kid. I was 20. No, I was 19 when I went in. And, uh, you know, you're 19 years old. You, you've never seen your, your head bare before. And uh, so some guys had misshapen heads, things like that. There was one dude that we ended up nicknaming naming him Alien Nation because his, when his head was shaved and once we got out in the sun a little bit, he got all these dark splotches on his scalp. And if and it, I'm being mean here, I guess, but I'm just telling you a story. If you guys ever realized there was a show in the 80s and late 80s called Alien Nation about these aliens and they had these like splotches on their bald heads. <laughs> so this dude's nickname was Alien Nation. It awakened the alien on his head, shaving his head. And I guess that just reminded me of that because when you burn your grass down and get rid of it, who knows what you're waking up under there that should probably be left covered up, right? Now, he also brought in topsoil, though, and that could have been also what it was. You know, bringing in topsoil, you have to realize you're taking a chance that whatever comes in with that. I mean, I know everybody think, oh, yeah, I'm going to add organic topsoil to my lawn, but there's a lot of stuff that could be in there, right? You know, you don't know who's been tending that. They don't, you know, somebody that may be selling you topsoil didn't think this is going in a lawn. They might be selling it for all kinds of reasons. And they don't care if there's seeds in it, right? So you just don't know. It's kind of like taking performance enhancing drugs. Are you going to let Jose Canseco, are you going to let Jose Canseco inject you from his dirty jean bag? You know what I mean? You don't know what he's putting in you. You know, you want to, if you're going to, take a performance enhancing drug. You want to get that from a reputable doctor. And I kind of see that topsoil. Are you getting that Jose Canseco topsoil? <laughs> you know, probably not the best analogy there, but you get what I'm saying. So you always have to be careful what you bring into your lawn, what you introduce into your lawn, just like you want to be careful what you introduce into your body, because you never know what the long-term effects of that could be. So wherever the Poa annua came from, those are two warnings that you don't want to wake up sleeping aliens and you also don't want to bring in foreign substances if you can help it. So he's stuck with that now. So then Spencer says he went ahead with the front and he seeded in the spring. And I've always encouraged you not to do that as well for this exact reason because the thing that germinates in the spring is crabgrass. And so you're going to be doing all of this watering and all of this fertilizing to get your good grass to grow and right alongside of it is that crabgrass. because And in this case, he burned it down. So he opened it up for the crabgrass, and the crabgrass will outrun your good grass in most cases. So we got a double whammy going on here. Now, the thing about that is, Spencer, is I need to caution you here because what you're left with, let's go back to the back lawn, is your poa annua is all mostly dead now because it's hot, 
And so what you're left with is all the seeds that it dropped. So if you go into the fall and you plan to aerate and overseed now in the fall, you're going to have really nothing to help you against that poa annua because people do talk a lot about tenacity as a pre-emergent. And it is an excellent pre-emergent at the time of seeding, but it's best used in spring because it works well against crabgrass. But if you read the label on tenacity as a pre-emergent, it's pre-emergent properties. And by the way, tenacity is not a pre-emergent. It has pre-emergent properties. It's a post-emergent weed control that can be used in specific situations, i.e. spring seeding, as a pre-emergent, and it has pre-emergent properties. But it's not a pre-emergent like prodiamine. It shouldn't be used that way. But when you're seeding in the spring, yes, because it can help you suppress or stop crabgrass. But if you read the label, it only has mild suppression on annual bluegrass. So what I'm telling you is it is not a good solution to if you have a really bad poa annua problem and you think you have a lot of seeds dropped, which I bet you do here, tenacity as a pre-emergent along with your seeding is just going to only slow down the problem slightly as a percentage, but it's not going to cure it. And I recommend you need to nip this in the bud now. This is like a cancer. Poa annua is a cancer in the lawn and you need to nip it in the bud immediately. You need to quit it right now. So I'm going to take you back and I'm going to say for your back lawn, what I recommend here, Spencer, is we have to hope above all hope that some of that grass that you did plant in the fall is still alive. And I'm going to assume it is. And if it is, we need to nurse that along. And what you need to do is when you get into the fall, as your soil temps are falling to 70 degrees, and if you want to know down to the sidewalk level, when your soil temps are falling to 70 degrees, you can get our free app at yardmastery.com slash app or just search Yardmastery app in the stores. It's a free app. We put this out for you. And it gives you real-time soil temps, 24-hour average soil temps for your address. Now, you don't have to put your address in there, but you can. If you put your exact address in there, we'll give you the soil temp down to the very you know street that you live on. If you just put in your city, we'll give you an average for your city. But either way, you'll get the soil temp. So as you're, and that's on our app. So as you get down to clo- approaching 70 degrees, Spencer, because you had that really bad poa annua, you know those seeds are in there. I recommend you apply prodiamine or dithiapyr. People keep asking when we're going to have that back in the shop. We'll have that back in the shop next week. If you haven't used up your allocation of prodiamine for the year, there is a yearly maximum on it, which I don't think you probably have. Then you should go ahead and use prodiamine. It does stick in the soil a little bit better. However, if you have used your allocation of prodiamine for the year, then go ahead and use dithiapyr. It's going to work just about the same, just about as well. The other thing I do want to announce is we do have very small allocations, or it's not small allocations, but we have the WDG, water dispersible granule, coming out for prodiamine, but we have it in small quantities. Right now, you can only buy five pounds. I've got a friend. I'll announce his name and company and all that, but he went to bat and helped me get very small quantities of WDG coming out so you don't have to buy five pounds worth. But anyway, that's what you want to do, Spencer. You want to put down that pre-emergent as as temperatures come to 70 degrees. Now, there's some things you get, though, as an advantage with that. Without seeding, you get to now start bombing again with nitrogen, and you can hit it hard and really work to thicken up the grass that's there, the turf that you did get grown last year. So hit it with nitrogen every four weeks, man. Just start nailing it. Hit it, it. If you have a soil test, you need phosphorus. Put some phos in there, man. Push some roots. Push some biostimulants. Just just gangbusters that lawn all fall, knowing that you put a pre-emergent down, and you may want to do even a second follow-up app six weeks later, depending you know how warm your year is there in Massachusetts. But that's what I would do, and I would nurture the grass that's there. That's really your, your uh, best course of action and you're going to need to do that for a couple years because again those seeds will sit dormant so just work with the grass that you have love the one you're with and push that forward now in the interest of being thorough and making sure that i covered the detail right here this is alan i'm breaking in during the edit i just want to say because he had a poa annua problem i have recommended no seeding and no aeration in the fall Instead, he needs to go to a pre-emergent strategy, which is prodiamine or dithiapyr, and then push the current lawn that he has. I just want to be real clear on that. 
no aeration and no overseeding when you know you've had a really bad poa annua problem. And that is because poa annua germinates in the fall and it will germinate right alongside of the aeration and overseeding or the overseeding that you're doing and you'll continue to compound the problem. So when you know you've had really bad poa annua, you go straight to fall pre-emergence and you do that for the next several years and nurture the lawn that you have. Now let's get back and talk about his problem that he has in the front, which was a crabgrass problem. Totally different strategy. For your front lawn, you have a different situation there because you said you didn't have a poa annua problem. Your problem is crabgrass. So I'm going to recommend that you go and you get on top of that crabgrass immediately. It's probably still fairly small. Get some quinclorac and just start hosing it. If you have tenacity, tenacity will work well on us. Some of it that gets away from you as opposed to emergent. Just start hammering on it. The front lawn, because you didn't have the poa annua problem, that can get an aeration overseed in the fall. But you won't need a pre-emergent there. I don't recommend pre-emergent in the fall, like a tenacity, I mean. I definitely don't recommend prodiamine or thiopyr because it'll kill whatever Kentucky bluegrass or tall fesky you put in there. But for sure, you don't, you could, you don't want to use tenacity either. Not going to help you much as I currently previously illustrated, but you have to realize that any grass or any weeds that come up alongside of your fall seeding are going to be killed by the winter. That's the thing that you guys with the cool season lawns get is you get winter as a reset button. We don't have that luxury down here in the south. Our soil never sleeps, and therefore the weeds are always growing and trying to take the land. But you guys get that winter time, so that's why fall seeding works so well. Aerate, overseed, push the lawn, mow it a couple, two tree times, let the winter kill off everything else. Then next spring, you start it and pick it back up. So there's uh, the tips that I have for you. Let me make sure I didn't miss anything here in that. It was quite a, quite a long question there. I think I got everything. So I'll just summarize, though, real quick. Don't burn the lawn down. Love the one you're with. Aeration overseed, best in the fall, not the spring. If you do have a POA annua problem, that means it's dropped seeds in the summer, I recommend you forego and stop doing any seeding in the fall this is for any of you that have poa annua problems. No seeding in the fall. Go with pre-emergence heavy and push the lawn that you have with nitrogen and thicken it up that way. Also, don't forget frequent mowing. Always a good way. All right, let's go on to our next one. Now, this one is a zoysia question, and I got this one in from Alex. He lives in South Florida. I'm going to give you a little sad music with this one because Alex was pretty concerned about what was going on there, and he's worked really hard, and I think he may even got some bad information, but... I think he's going to be on the right track because I consulted him a little bit through email. And I'll have a couple pictures that go along with this one that I'll put up here on the side if you're on YouTube. But either way, here we go. My name is Alex Mendoza. I live in South Florida. As a homeowner, I've been struggling to keep my lawn in good shape. Last year after battling with my lawn, I ended up replacing my entire lawn due to the complication of errors. I was told that I killed it with love, too much water, too much fertilizer, at the wrong rates and the wrong times. I ended up with a burned lawn and brown patch fungus and it was beyond repair. I started getting as much information as I was able to obtain. I saw all these videos of yours and others and by December I decided I was going to get a new lawn. I installed that lawn and I applied non-selective atrazine, scalped it down in the spring, as I was doing this, I had seven full months of struggling again until now. I had replaced it with Empire Zoysia in early February, updated the irrigation system with a zone system, bought the biostimulant pack. I was very cautious about applying this, followed the labels. I've been watering every three days, half an inch, tuna can challenge. About two weeks ago, my backyard, about 320 square feet, just started to show decay and signs that the grass was going back to where it had been before. It all happened to be around this red maple tree. After seeing some of your videos, I started to think that maybe I'm overwatering again. I'm not sure of that. I bought a water pH light gauge, took multiple readings. The water gauge reading goes all the way to the max moisture saturation. I have a sandy soil, as you know. My backyard has partial sunlight. The sun starts hitting the grass at 10 a.m., loses direct sunlight about five. This gives me seven hours of direct sunlight. I've also trimmed the canopy of the tree to remove as much sunshade as possible. I've been applying granular insecticide and fungicide every three months. I forgot to mention my front and side looks beautiful and thick and lush. I have not done a soil test yet, but the gauge says it's a 6.5 pH. I know that I do have to do a soil test, but I'm just trying to paint the picture of where I'm at. 
and I have a couple questions for you. Where in wood would you recommend I get my soil test? What fertilizers would you recommend for me to use? But most importantly, I'm concerned about this spot under the tree. Please help. All right. <laughs> There's a lot going on there. He's done a lot of things. Let me summarize because I kind of I was kind of skipping through it as I was going through. So he has zoysia and uh, so, some areas of it, especially around this tree, started to die out. And he thought maybe he overwatered it. He thought he had uh, drowned it out, put too much fertilizer down, all these kind of things. So he resodded. He scalped it down, killed it all off, and then he resodded. And then now seven months later, it's starting to struggle again. But the key here that, that I keyed in on here, Alex, is that he said the rest of the lawn looks beautiful. It's mainly only the area right around this maple tree. Now, <laughs> interestingly enough, I don't know that there's that many maples in Florida. I, I don't see, I see a ton of oaks. I don't see a lot of maples. But one thing I know about maples is they typically have a fairly shallow root system. And they're also very selfish trees. Trees in general are the natural enemies to lawns. Never forget that. Now, palm trees are not. Palms are essentially not really a tree. They're actually a grass. So never forget that palms are not the actual natural enemy to lawns. But deciduous trees are. Maples are very selfish. They'll suck everything out of the ground. And there's something that I wanted to, that I pointed out to Alex here, and that is that with those shallow roots, the first thing to consider is that the grass may not have a lot of room to really go very deep, the zoysia. And so it was doing fine in the spring when things were more mild. But now that we've had really hot temps, we're in the high 90s down here in uh, southwest Florida, south Florida, it's probably starting to show the lack of deeper roots that it's just not able to obtain because those maple roots are there and they're stopping the zoysia from really getting a lot. Additionally, that maple's probably taking a lot of the nutrients out of the ground. In fact, probably all, because I don't think maples grow real well in sandy soil. And there isn't a lot of nutrient in sandy soil anyway, which is what a lot of us have here in Florida. So it's going to grab every bit of nutrient that it can, and it's going to steal it right away from that grass. Now, one thing he mentioned, though, is that he does have a lot of moisture in the area. So I would definitely recommend... If the ground is saturated all the time, Alex, that you maybe look at installing some drains there. Surface drains, French drains, do a little bit of research. I did uh, quite, I did both here at my house. But you want to definitely do that. I would also look at where your downspouts from your house are pushing out. Are they pushing out into that area? Maybe redirect those. Because you don't want your grass, your zoysia, sitting in constantly wet conditions for sure. That will invite more disease. But if you're looking at the pictures here on YouTube, that doesn't look like disease to me. What that looks like is it looks like it's just heat stressed and it has weak root system and it's just struggling from that. Now, the one thing he did say is he recently has um, trimmed back the tree to allow more sunlight and that will certainly help. The other thing that happens though is when it rains, there is different salts and things that'll wash off the leaves of the trees and that can affect the grass underneath. It's kind of a natural defense mechanism as well as if it's dropping leaves, which I don't know if it does, but that can't help either. But for sure, it's really hard to grow grass very much up close to the base of a tree. So one thing you might want to consider, Alex, is just foregoing grass there and turning that into a planting bed, maybe put some caladium in there, something like that that would look good around the tree. If not, then the strategy would be to paint it black with humic acid all around the base of the tree to try to help enough you know, get the roots to move as much as they can, maybe some RGS in there as well, and then spray the trunk of the tree with the OO2 microgreen. Try to get it to take its nutrients in that way rather than through the roots. And I actually talked to a guy here locally that uh, we hired out at our church who uses Green County Fertilizer products, and he does. He says he sprays all the deciduous trees with the OO2 microgreen on the trunks, and he says it works really well. Something I'm looking at experimenting with. I just don't have any deciduous trees here. But anyway, Alex, that's really the, the concern here, man. You haven't burned your lawn. You haven't put down too much fertilizer. None of that, especially, again, because you're telling me the rest of the lawn looks great. And zoysia can take a lot of fert. It's really just that tree. And so that's the, the lesson here for the rest of you all is that grass just won't do well around a tree. It's just not going to do well in any case 
at any time. So if that's the case, it's always best to try to just mitigate that by, sorry, cutting the tree down or by just not growing grass around the tree. So quick answer there. And uh, I had emailed with Alex back and forth, and I think he's feeling a lot better. He's got a nice looking backyard there. So hopefully just cut that tree down, my man. Put a, put a palm in there. <laughs> that's what I would recommend. All right, I'm going to go now to a little bit of a little bit of music for you guys, kind of pick things back up. And then when I come back, we'll take some more of your questions. Hope you like that one. All right, now we are going to go now to our recorded calls. These are the ones that came in on 833 LCN tips. And we're going to go to Jeff over by Fort Wayne, Indiana. Hi, Alan. My name is Jeff. I live in Fort Wayne, Indiana. 
I've got a mixture of Kentucky blue and ryegrass, perennial ryegrass, and I've got about four acres to take care of. I wonder if you could do a segment on the podcast where taking care of larger lawns, what the priorities might be. I spray for weeds and I put milorganite down. However, milorganite is extremely hard to get in Fort Wayne or any surrounding area. So if we could have some tips how you take care of a larger lawn without breaking the bank and um, what might you do to control the large fescue that keeps popping up throughout areas in the yard. Okay, I appreciate it. Thanks, Alan, and thanks for all your videos. Really, really enjoy them. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, Jeff. Great question. So, yeah, I've got some experience this year, actually, with some larger lawns. Obviously, when I worked for True Green Kim Lawn, I worked with larger lawns, but as a DIYer, I started working on some larger lawns. I've been working at the Freedom Factory, which is 100,000 square feet. Now, it's not four acres. You know, an acre is 43,500, so it's a little over two acres, but still, it's not a small lawn. So, Jeff's like, hey, man, give me some advice here. So, the first piece of advice that I would say with a large property like that is you're not going to be able to manicure it perfectly all four acres. Holy cow, man, you, you'd you break the bank for sure you would. <laughs> the other thing is, man, that's a lot to do. So what I recommend you do typically when you have four acres is why don't you choose like 10,000 in the front, maybe 15,000 in the back, so 25,000 and make that just around the house, maybe a couple, two, three thousand on each side over there. And so maybe you have like a 30,000 square foot area around your house and make that your showpiece, make that your pristine lawn. And that's the one that you do invest the most of your money in and you go on a standard program, okay? So that's the one where you're fertilizing every four to six weeks. You know, like our app says, you, you're you putting down your pre-emergence, maybe you're, you're spraying for weeds when you need to. And we'll talk about equipment in a minute because it's still a big section. So you're not gonna do most of this with a two gallon pump sprayer, but... That's what I recommend you do first is cordon off that 30,000 square foot around the house or whatever is logical based on the shape of your property and where your house is located on that property and make that your pristine area. Then your other three, three acres, you know, going to be a little bit different, right? A little bit not get so much care, but still something. You want to still keep the weeds down. You still want to keep it looking fairly nice. Oh, by the way, the other thing is with that 30,000 square feet, you'll be able to keep that irrigated, invest in that. I'm assuming, you know, you're a rich guy with four acres. You could afford to, to irrigate 30,000 of it, right? <laughs> bigger lawn, bigger wallet. I guess that's kind of how that works, right? But for sure that you want to irrigate the 30,000, you're probably not going to be able to irrigate the entire four acres. So again, focus all the treatment or the main treatment on that 30,000 square foot area. Now for the rest, what are we going to do? the other three acres. The first thing I'm going to say is, is that with your ides, you want to go liquid. What are ides? Those are your pesticides. So herbicides. Herbicides are things that kill or alter the growth of a plant. So weed killer, that's a herbicide. Prodiamine is a herbicide. It alters the growth habit of a plant. Your uh, insecticides. Insecticides are things that kill bugs or alter their growth habit. You have your fungicides. Those are things that will alter or stop a fungus. You get the idea, right? Those are your ides. You're always going to be saving lots of money. And I'm going to work some math out here for you. You're going to save so much money if you do your ides in liquids. So let me give you an example here, okay? And I, I wrote all this down. So prodiamine pre-emergent, you can get a five pound jug of the WDG, that's wettable dispersible granule. You get a five pound jug of that and that's going to be $67. That's We have that on our website, thelawncarenot.com. Yard Mastery has it. You can get it pretty much everywhere. It's not like it's anything special. So $67, and that five pounds will cover about four acres. Now, we're going to assume you're doing, you're going to, you're going to do your, your, uh, your whole property with this prodiamine, not just the three acres that's rough versus the one acre that's not rough, the whole four acres, right? So to make my math easy, then that $67 will cover all four acres for pre-emergent. Not a bad deal, right? $67 for an app of Prodiamine Pre-Emergent for four acres. Now, let me let me illustrate for you what that would cost if you did it in granular. Now, you're not going to find straight Prodiamine at most big box stores, but we have it, um, obviously, on our website. I'm pretty sure pretty soon these big box stores, they'll start carrying it 
Just like they all have Malorganite clones now, they're going to start carrying their own Prodiamine. You watch. That's how demand works from you guys. You guys are a very powerful audience. But here in Florida, you can get a straight Prodiamine from Sunnyland. It's a 50-pound bag, and it's 25 bucks. okay? So let's just use that math. That's store-bought Prodiamine 007. It's the same stuff we sell, except it's at the store. So $25. So 50-pound bag covers 20,000 square feet. So if an acre is 43,500... That means that four acres is 174,000. So you would need 8.7 bags of the dry stuff. So just call it nine bags of the dry stuff. That would cost you $225 for that app. So if you do the liquid, which is the water dispersible granule, you put that in your sprayer. We'll talk about equipment in a minute. That'll cover that four to five acres, and that will cost you $67. If you do the granular, assuming you can find it at a store local to you, which 99% of you listening to this can't, but if you could, and you did the granular, that'd be $225. So $67 versus 225 That's why the liquids are better. By the way, you can find granular pre-emergence in stores, but they're always mixed with fertilizer, which adds even more to the cost, just so you know. All right, let's do another example. By the way, both of those do need to be watered in. Now, up in Fort Wayne, you're going to be doing that in the spring when you're getting rain, so that's a good thing. The WDG formulation needs to be watered in a little faster than the granular. The granular has a little longer, but those do degrade in the sun, FYI. So you want to get those watered in. Let's go to bifenthrin, another eyed. This is an insecticide. And bifenthrin is what we use really generally on a four-acre property would be great because it's going to kill the nuisance pests like the ants, the fleas, ticks. You know, you don't want those. But it'll also kill if you get damaging pests like sod webworm. Oh, another nuisance pest that kills mosquito. So bifenthrin is a good one to use as a general all-around insect killer. So you can get liquids there, a three-quarter gallon. It's called Bifen IT. That's the, the generic of Bifenthrin. 7.9% is the concentration. You can get 96 ounces of that liquid concentrate for $55. The max rate on that's one ounce per thousand. So if you use the max rate, you'll get 96,000 square feet out of a 96-ounce bottle. Right? So you're going to need a couple of jugs, just say. You're just going to need two jugs. So that's $110. So if you wanted to do an app on the four acres liquid with the bifen, that's a liquid concentrate, you mix in water and spray it out, it would cost you $110. Now let's say you found the same exact product, bifenthrin granular, which you can get on Do My Own, and it is $32 a bag, and the bag covers 10,000 square feet. So you'd need 17 bags of the granular, which would cost you $541. So if you went with liquid bifin, you're going to pay $110 for an app versus the granular bifin is going to cost you $541. And that's nothing against Do My Own. They're just the ones that sell it. Everybody else would be the same. So the idea being, this is another illustration that it is cheaper to go liquid when it comes to your eyes. Okay. All right, now let's go back to the granulars because, or uh, fertilizers, I'm sorry. He said he was using malorganite. Holy cow, bro. I mean, whether you can find malorganite or not, that is expensive. Milo is $14 a bag. It's a 640 analysis and it's a 32 pound bag. So, due to the size of this property, you know, you're going to need a lot of bags. So, if you wanted to put down three quarter pound of nitrogen, which I mean, I don't think you're going to, I mean, on that much acreage, you're going to see how much it's going to cost. I wouldn't do, I would do that in spring and fall maybe because most of it's going to go dormant in the summer anyway. So besides the 30,000 square foot around your house, I really wouldn't apply fertilizer to the rest of the field in the summer at all, knowing that it's probably going to go dormant. But if you were going to apply, here's the malorganite cost to get down three quarter pounds of nitrogen. That's what, 12 pounds per thousand. So that means each bag will cover about 2,600 square feet. He has 174,000 square feet, so he's going to need 67 bags at a Milo. 67 bags. You're going to have to, your order, and that's like, I mean, a pallet is 40 bags. It's like almost two pallets that you got to carry there. That's $938 per application if you're paying $14 a bag. So call it $1,000. It costs you a grando to do an app. Bigger lawn, bigger wallet, my brother. Drink some more beer when you're done. So... I do want to do a little comparison here because I've done this before, but it's been a while and people, it opens their eyes. Carbon X is actually cheaper than Malorganite. And that's because Malorganite takes so much pounds on the ground to get the yield because it's a 640, right? So 6% nitrogen, whereas Carbon X is 24% nitrogen, 
2404, 24% nitrogen. So let's do a little idea there. Carbon X is $59.99, so $60 a bag. That bag covers 15,000 square feet. So the Milo bag only covers 2,600, it's 32, versus the Carbon X bag that is a 45 pound bag covers 15,000. There's not a lot of correlation there, but the idea being $60, 15,000 square foot coverage. To get three quarter pound of nitrogen, you only have to put three pounds per thousand. So Milo, in order to get three quarter pounds of nitrogen, you have to put down 12 pounds per thousand, a lot of pounds on the ground. Carbon X, because it has so much more nitrogen, you only have to put down three pounds per thousand. So here's where the math works out. You only need 12 bags of Carbon X. Okay, so you needed 67 bags of Milorganite. You only need 12 bags of Carbon X. 12 bags will cost you $719. So look at the, what I'm saying here. $1,000, $938 for an apple Milorganite or $719 for an application of Carbon X. Now, some of you are freaking out. You're like, I wouldn't pay any of that. Guys, he has four acres, okay? It, the math works out, though. It's cheaper by the by the in rate to get Carbon X. Both good for the soil, so both have iron. You know, all of that. Okay, so if you're going to go with granulars, I would definitely look at going with something higher nitrogen. And that's really what I'm saying there. Am I trying to sell you some carbon X? Of course I am. But what you should really do is get something with a higher number of nitrogen because that means less pounds on the ground so you don't have to buy as many bags and it should be cheaper overall. That's really the lesson there. The hot, When you have a big property like that, and in general, the higher the nitrogen, the less pounds on the ground. Okay. If you wanted to do liquid, if you wanted to go liquid for your fertilizer, you get the 1801 green punch. Now, that you're not going to get three-quarter pound out of that, of nitrogen. You could, but you don't need to. Because he, John Perry formulates it with sea kelp, humic, and he has some iron in there, you know, those the nutrients go a little bit further. You get a, a pop of color without having to put as much nitrogen down. That's his whole philosophy is less inputs, lower inputs, low nitrogen. That's John Perry's philosophy. And if you're on the liquid programs, you see you get really good results with much less input, with much less on the ground. So with the 1801 green punch, it's 16 ounces per thousand. That's going to yield you right, right around a quarter pound of nitrogen per thousand. If you have 174,000 square feet times 16 ounces per thousand, you need 2,784 ounces. That's 21.72 gallons. So just call it 22 gallons that you need. It's about 26.20 per gallon. So the cost of your application with 1801 green punch at 26.20 per gallon and you need 22 gallons will be $676. So actually a liquid application going by the John Perry philosophy there of the lower end, which I do tell you works if you like liquid, and I'm a, we're talking about equipment in a minute, your app there will be 676. So back to it, a Milo app at three quarter pounds of in, $719. A Carbon X app at three quarter pounds of in, $676. I'm sorry, let me go back and say that one more time. I messed it up. A Milo app at three quarter pounds of in, $938. A Carbon X app at three quarter pounds of nitrogen, seven hundred and nineteen dollars, and a liquid eighteen oh one green punch app at one quarter pound of nitrogen juiced with sea kelp to and uh, iron to boost it, six hundred and seventy six. So just looking at the pocketbook there, the liquid is the least expensive. Okay, now let's go and talk about equipment because this is another thing you're going to have to make an investment in. So I have gotten quite a bit of experience this year with pull behind equipment. So that's the thing. I'm sure you have some sort of a tractor or zero turn here that you're pulling this with, Jeff. So you already even made that investment, whatever that investment is. I mean, on four acres, you might have something fairly substantial. You might have six or seven grand in your mower or your tractor or whatever you're mowing with. So in that case, you can get a pull behind sprayer. Now, the minimum size pull behind sprayer I'd recommend if you were going to go with liquids would be a 25 gallon. I have experience with the AgriFab and it's worked great. I actually think that probably a 25 gallon is a little small for four acres. I wouldn't, it, it, I would say it's good for two acres or a little more. Like I use it at the Freedom Factory and I'm like, yeah, okay, it works. You know what I mean? But even there, it seems a little small. So, you know, pull behind sprayer like that, going to cost you somewhere north of $350. You go up to 30, 40 gallon, you might be around $450 to $500 
for a pull behind sprayer. So there's that investment, but that gets out all your liquids. Now keep in mind, you're saving a lot of money if you've been applying these these insecticides and fun or um, uh, herbicides and things like that for weeds. You're get you have substantial savings there that you can invest in that pull behind sprayer. Now the other thing you're going to need then is a pull behind spreader if you do want to do some granular applications, and uh, those are cheaper. I have the 130 pound tow behind spreader from Agrifab has worked well, has a nice spread pattern. It's like eight to 10 feet spread pattern, depending how fast you're going. That's $180. You know, that would probably be big enough for four acres. You might want to get something a little bigger. So, you know, in that regard, you're going to be somewhere around six, seven or $800 just in the equipment to get the fertilizer or your herbicides out. So that's another thing to consider. The other consideration is, and this is something I'm still working with. So I, I grew up in True Green using permagreens. And in fact, permagreen used to have a facility there in Merrillville, Indiana, over by there when I worked there. And we actually, not me personally, but my technicians, they they did a lot of the testing and a lot of the, they had the prototypes. We used to get their prototypes that were all just white fiberglass that they had put together. And we would go out and beat them up and use them on our properties and tell them what we liked, didn't like, make sure nobody died on them, <laughs> dumped over, whatever. But yeah, those triumphs and that, those, uh, that was my branch office that did a lot of that testing. And we were the first um, branch in True Green that had a fleet of ride-on spreaders. This was in, when was this, 2006, 7, 8, maybe, 9, 2009? Maybe a little later than that. Sometime in that 8, 9 range. True Green had not adopted the ride-on. Guys were still walking large properties at that time. Or they just sometimes would turn down some larger properties if they couldn't give them to commercial what am I talking about? True Green never turns down a property, but it was, you'd have maybe like one ride-on route, but the Maryville branch proved that you could actually do ride-ons and even lawns down to the size of 10,000 square feet. And now I think there's guys doing lawns on, doing ride-on spreaders on really small lawns. But anyway, so I have a lot of experience with those sprayer spreaders, ride-on spreaders. I actually have here that I'm testing now a Ferris Pathfinder XC. It's the FS2200, has a 16-gallon tank on it, has a 200-pound uh, a spiker hopper on it for the granular. And it, to me, it runs and sounds just like a permagreen. <laughs> but that is an investment you may want to make. And some of you, when I tell you the price, they start at like nine grand for that. Some of you are like, no way, bro. But listen, I, you have four acres. There are people that'll do that. I, I know that at GIE, I see DIYers looking at these. I know DIYers buy them. I've seen a few. You know, maybe you want to call the local lawn company, though, and say, hey, when you guys get ready to retire one of your old ride-ons, I'd like to purchase it. Just like these guys do with the real mowers. They buy them from golf courses. Maybe you want to buy one from your local lawn company, a used one, because you don't have to take it out every day. So maybe they don't use it anymore. And by the way, they build, they have a lot of rebuild kits, especially for the permagreens that you can get. So maybe you want to look at something like that. Maybe you want to get a used one like these guys do with the real mowers. They buy the used Toro real mowers off the golf courses. Maybe you want to buy a used permagreen. Check your Facebook marketplace, that kind of stuff. But that's another option. I will tell you that with that right on that Pathfinder, I can actually do about two acres, a little over two acres with that 16-gallon tank. That's because it has a 10-foot spray swath, and they put the right tips on there so you can meter it out right. So you can get a lot of square footage done liquid-wise with one of those if you're willing to invest that nine grand. I'll be doing a review on that. It's kind of an extreme thing, but I saw the opportunity to get it. I don't own it. It's on loan to me, but I will be doing that. So as far as your tall fescue clumps out there, Jeff, I'm sorry, buddy. I got nothing for you on that. There is no non-selective herbicide or there is no selective herbicide that will kill tall fescue clumps without killing the rest of your lawn. So that's one of those you got to stop and dig them out or maybe... Maybe drive by with a golf cart and glyphosate them as you go. Something like that. So there you go. Big lawns. Went through some pricing, some ways to look at things to save a little bit of money and a little bit of the equipment. All right, let's go right into our next question. This is Steven in the Twin Cities talking a little bit about seed. Hi, my name's Steven. I'm from the Twin Cities in Minnesota. I got a um, tall fescue grass and uh, thinking of doing overseeding this upcoming fall and my question is around after doing the aeration doing starter fert um, dropping some normal fertilizer and then the um, the seed 
Um, should you put or topsoil over the top of that if you're overseeing, or is that only necessary for various spots? And we'll be able to hear more on the podcast. Thanks. All right. So Stephen broke up a little bit, but he's basically asking, hey, after I do my overseeding there in Minnesota, is there anything I should put over it, over top of it? So the one thing I do still recommend if you're going to do an overseeding is that you do aeration because of all the holes that you poke, and I recommend that you go over it three, four times, poke as many holes as you can. But I realize now over the years that a good majority of you can't do that or you won't do that. You don't have, you're not going to rent an aerator because you don't have the truck to get it home in, you don't, or you don't have the truck to pull the trailer, uh, or you just don't have the time. I get it. So in this case, if you're, and, and even if you are going to aerate, <clears throat> but you're going to seed, your seed will be fine. Air, overseed the lawn, okay? And then after that, you do want to use some sort of a covering, especially in the larger bare spots. And there's two reasons for that. The first reason, or three really, the, the first reason is, is it helps retain moisture. The second thing is, is it helps to simulate seed to soil contact. And the third is it'll keep it from washing away. That's the three reasons why you want to use some sort of a covering, especially in the larger bare areas. Now, if you aerate, that helps because that's stirring things up. That's bringing some topsoil up. That's going to some stuff goes down in the holes, you know, the cores stay up there. That helps to hold the seed in place. But even then, I recommend some covering. Now, there's two kind of coverings I recommend. The first is peat moss. It's the cheapest and easiest to get, and it's clean. However, peat moss can wash away, too. If you've ever used peat moss as a covering, you'll notice in a real heavy rainstorm, it'll just get washed away, too. It's fairly light. But the good news with peat moss is if you get it too heavy, it won't choke the seed out because it is so light. So there's some good stuff there. It also is an excellent soil amendment. So peat moss is one of those things that you can use, but the really the best thing to use is there's this stuff called Greenview Seed Starter. You could also get Scott's Patchmaster, which already has seed in it, but both of those are very similar. The Greenview Seed Starter, you can get it on Amazon. It's pellets, but it's essentially recycled paper that's in pellet form, and then when it gets wet, it spreads out and it gets sticky. And I think the Greenview even has some starter fertilizer in it. I still recommend you use your own on top of it because what they put in there isn't enough. The Scott's Patchmaster is more a... Uh, already comes fluffy. It looks like the stuffing from a pillow, kind of, and it's got seed in it. But the idea is you, you put that out thin, very thin, super thin, thinner than you think, and when it gets wet, it expands, and it's very sticky. And I have never found anything better to hold seed in, to hold in moisture, and simulate seed-to-soil contact. Scott's Patchmaster works awesome. It was my secret Back in the day when we used to burn lawns at True Green, and we didn't burn that many, but when we did burn them, I was the guy that always went out and fixed things, and that's the exact procedure I would use. Heavy, air, heavy aeration, overseed, Scott's Patchmaster, every single time. And even though the Patchmaster has seed in it, I always supplemented with my own. So that's what I recommend there, Stephen. Definitely have some sort of covering somewhere just to help hold things in, keep it sticky, and help you retain moisture. All right, we're going to play another music, another song here, and when we come back, we're going to go out to Plain City, Ohio.
you all that I got, oh, I confess with each beat of my heart, oh, I'll be true, so I'm not giving you up, no, I'll give you all that I got, oh, I confess with each beat of my heart, oh, I promise you, oh, oh. you guys are enjoying that music give you a little something something to listen to in the middle of the day get your blood pumping good all right all right let's go now out to steve in plain city ohio hi alan this is steve long turn up from plain city ohio uh just got a quick question for you i'm leaving my lush green lawn that you've helped me develop over the years in hilliard ohio to move into my new house in plain city where they have tall Fescue, same thing I have currently. I'm wondering, walking into a new yard, what advice do you have for somebody? Obviously, a soil test is going to be high on my list. Any information would be great. Thank you very much, Alan, and a belated happy birthday. Thanks, Steve. And I will tell you, congratulations on your new house, my brother. Awesome awesome that you have gone from one house and you've mastered the lawn there. And now on to your next one, new challenges. And so that's the first thing I want to do is give you advice that don't lose your fresh eyes. What I say that is when you looked, you guys, especially lawn care nuts, when you look at a new house, I already know that you're sizing up the lawn. And in fact, when I bought my house, one of the requirements was that it had to have a certain sized lawn. I wasn't going to be moving to some 2,000 square foot lawn. I wanted something bigger. And I know you're the same way. So not only are you looking at the size of the lawn that you want for your new house, but you're looking at the lawn itself. And that's the fresh eyes. Now you may have noticed it's in really bad shape. It's in good shape, whatever you notice, because typically it takes 30 to 60 days to close after you make an offer and you have an accepted offer, right? And even if your house hunt went for a while, it might be 45, 60 days from the first time you went to that house until now when you're moving in and you have those fresh eyes. Never take that for granted. What did you see back 60 days ago and what are you seeing now and why? And make notes on that. Use those fresh eyes to understand how that lawn has progressed just in the 45 to 60 days since you first saw it till the time you closed on it and made it your own. Then I would download the Yard Mastery app. That's the next thing I would do. And I would start recording all of the things that I notice. What am I seeing? Why did it change in those days? What was the weather like then? What is the weather like now? The next thing I would do is I would measure the lawn. It's the first thing you want to do because you want to get out and walk your land. I think that's such an important thing is to get out and walk that land. Now, I'm sure you're like me, and uh, in fact, I'm sure you are, Steve. You have measured your lawn already on satellite before you moved in. You probably drive by, right? I don't know how far away this city is from the current one, but when you have an offer on a new house, what do you do? You, You make extra reasons to go buy the house and look at it and see what's going on, right? Make sure they got that sold sign on the sale sign, right? Or pending or offer pending, whatever, right? You want to make sure everything's good. You want to make sure they're not letting the lawn go, whatever. But the other thing you did is is you measured it on satellite. But now the second thing you're going to do out here now when you actually own the house is you're going to walk the lawn. Understand what it's like to walk each area, measure it out, and start getting those sections off. One of the most important things we do as lawn care nuts is we section the lawn off into logical areas. I typically try to stress to you to get those in areas that are at least by the thousand square foot increment or the 1500 square foot increment, you know, thousand, 1500, 2000, 2500, try to get them in those increments. I personally like to be able to get them into 2000 square foot increments. I just think that's the easiest. And I think it works in most suburbs. And I don't know this area of Ohio. I don't know if you have sitting on acre lots or if you're sitting on postage stamps, but the idea is I like to get things corned off logically. 
The other thing that'll do is it'll let you see where are the bumps, where are the ruts, where are the bleeps, where are the creeps, where is the shade, where are the thin spots, where is it soggy, where is it not? Where do the downspouts run and what does that do to affect the lawn? You know, what trees are dropping, what were animals digging? All of those things. And I would record all of that in my Yard Mastery app and I would definitely take a whole bunch of pictures. The next thing I would do is I would enjoy a mow. I've walked it now. I've been thinking about this house for 45 or 60 days since I made my offer. Man, I would just enjoy a mow. The other thing that mowing does is it literally puts your hands in contact with the ground via the mower. So you can start now, not only you felt it with your feet when you walked, now you can feel it through your hands and through your arms. You can feel what's going on and keep taking notes. Where are those bumps? For sure, I would get a soil test. And uh, you would go ahead and do that right away. You already mentioned you're going to do that, so that's cool. And the next thing I would do is, because it's summer, is I would work out my watering plan. If you have in-ground spring irrigation, then that's a whole thing. You're going to go through the in-ground irrigation. You're going to learn your system inside and out, learn your controller inside and out, decide if you want to replace it or not. Your wife's going to replace all the shower curtains and in in, in shower bathroom um, carpets because that's what happens. My wife, every time we've moved into a new house, we get new shower curtains. The old shower curtains from the old house aren't can't come. You got to get new shower curtains. Well, you need to get a new sprinkler controller. Or if you're going to go manual, then definitely you want to get out and get that watering plan, do that tuna can challenge, find out, do the irrigation sprinklers that you have, are they good enough or do you need something else? Or do you have enough, enough hose bibs? Do you need to get more hoses? By the way, the other thing you enjoy the mow will do is let you realize if your previous equipment that you had is going to be adequate for this new house. I know when I moved in to this house, I moved from St. Pete where I had, geez, I don't know, 3,000 square feet, barely to here where I had 10,000, I don't have that now because I've done some landscaping and stuff, but to here where I had 10,000, and I found that a 20-inch mower, I mean, I could do it, but man, it took so much longer. That's why I ended up getting the Time Master because I, there was times I needed to get out there and get her done. So that's those things you're going to discover as you do that. And then the first application that I would make would be humic acid. You don't have your soil test back yet, but I would put down a good application to humic acid and just see what I can flush out of the soil. You'd be surprised... And who knows how that's been treated there, but you'd be surprised that humic acid can flush a lot of really, a lot of nutrients out of the soil that are already there and give you a green up. So that's the things I would do moving into a new house and getting myself set up in a brand new house. Next, let's go to Logan. Going to talk about some dog urine in Wyoming. Alan, my name is Logan Tomer. I live in Gillette, Wyoming. I have a cool season lawn of Kentucky bluegrass. I bought a product off Amazon to help dead dog spots from urine damage. Uh, it's by Lawn Mutt. And on the back, it's telling me that how to ap apply it, obviously. And then it tells me that if I use a nitrogen-rich fertilizer, dead urine spots will start popping up. So my question is, is there a correlation between nitrogen-rich fertilizer and my dog's urine killing the lawn almost as soon as he goes. You can almost literally watch it turn brown within a day. Uh, be great if you could answer this question. Love the podcast. Thanks for all your help. Thank you. All right, Logan, this is a good one. So I got to tell you, in the top five questions that we get at Yard Mastery and the Lawn Care Nut, dog urine related questions are in that top five. So it's about time I kind of covered this as well as I've had uh, some experiments going on with dog urine that I will be rolling out a video. It has something we had to film for literally an entire year, but I'll be rolling a video on that very soon. But let's go back to what we know. So think about the word urine. I want everybody to do that right now. Just in your mind, think about the word urine. 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 What does that sound like? Does it sound like something that we find in fertilizers that we put on our lawns? Urine. Urea. Oh, urea. Yeah, urea. If you look at most fertilizers, they're going to have some sort of, some form of urea, urea nitrogen as a source, as a nitrogen source in that fertilizer. So let's look at what mammal urine is. So your body creates ammonia when it breaks down proteins from foods, and ammonia contains nitrogen, which mixes with other elements in your body, including carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen to form urea. Urea is a waste product and it's excreted by the kidneys when you urinate. So you're literally peeing out urea. Now there's also some salt in there. 
you know, so chloride, sodium, potassium, salts, things like that. And so when dog urine kills the grass, it's two things. It's an overabundance of urea and also an overabundance of salts. And by the way, this is how you burn lawns with fertilizer too. It's too much salts and too much urea or too much nitrogen altogether can burn a lawn. So just think about that. How many of you have a dog and when your dog pees, it doesn't kill the grass, it actually turns it dark green. You'll see this a lot after winter too when your dog has peed on top of the snow and then all the snow's gone, you'll have all these really dark green areas. Well, that's because the snow has filtered the, the, gra- the pee down enough to where it's just been a good nitrogen source for the lawn and it hasn't harmed it. And then some dogs that don't have as big of a bladder, I guess, or they don't have as concentrated of urine, they can also turn the grass green. But in this case, the dog is killing the lawn. Now, I want you to know I consulted John Perry on this. He helped me with this because I'm not an expert on dog urine and dog pee and all this. But I was been experimenting with his products, and I told you we're going to make a video about it. But he brought up a couple good points too. You know, your dog's diet can be a determining factor in how strong the pee is. The size of the bladder, I mentioned that. Also, and this is what John Perry told me, and I didn't think about this, but female dogs squat, male dogs um, lift their leg, and they pee from a higher higher up. So the male dog sprays the concentrates around, whereas the female dog squats and is closer to the ground and concentrates it into one single spot. So that's why sometimes people will say that a female dog will burn the lawn more than a male dog. It isn't that the pee is necessarily different. It's that the female dog squats, and so she is concentrating all her pee into one spot where the male dog's spraying and praying everywhere. (laughs) So that's something to think about. The other thing is, and John brought this up, is, you know, when the pee comes out of the dog, it's like 99 degrees, and that's hot, man. If it's like 99 outside and 99 degree pee, that could be a burn spot. So the product that you got there, whatever it's called, something mutt, I looked it up on Amazon. It's like 44 bucks, and um, here's what's in it. 1.5% 1.5% ammoniacal nitrogen, 1% nitrate nitrogen, 6.5% urea nitrogen, humic acid, and fulvic acid. That's all that's in it. $45, and they recommend that you spray the lawn, and it covers 3,200 square feet. They recommend that you spray the lawn where your dog pees every six weeks. That is some expensive, expensive fertilizer. I'm using air quotes because they don't sell it as a fertilizer. They sell it as a dog pee remedy, so... I'm going to be careful how unkind I am to this product because I'm sure it does serve a purpose. But really, guys, (laughs) we have products that have a lot more nitrogen and a lot more humic and a lot more fulvic in them, okay? So here's the deal. I don't know if that product will work as a spray and pray as a blast. I am assuming that the back of it, and I didn't read the part where it tells you to put more nitrogen down, but I'm assuming they're just hoping, above all hope, that you're also watering your lawn and you're just going to grow it back out. Now, here's the deal. If you were to put humic acid and RGS, which contains sea kelp, on the pee spots right after your dog pees, mix them in water, and put them on after your dog pees, that will stabilize and even go to neutralize the strength of the urea and the salts, and you won't get the burn. I have a video coming to show you this. And the water also helps. So, you know, take that for what it's worth. Sure, the humic acid, the fulvic acid, the sea kelp help the lawn to generate more roots, help to stabilize the the pea. By the way, the pH of the pea is neutral, so it's not the pH doing anything. But those things do help. They help to, to stabilize those nutrients, but the water also helps to literally water down the pea. So that's something to think about. So you can keep using that product, but I don't think that there's anything magical about it. Again, I've told you what's in it, and it's very low percentages of nitrogen. It's it's only um, 9% nitrogen, and then you have to put it in a pump sprayer or a, or a hose-in sprayer and a little bit of humic and a little bit of fulvic. We've got all that available to us. If you want the secret right now, you put 9 ounces of humic and 9 ounces of RGS in a 5-gallon bucket or in a 5-gallon pitcher, and you just dispense that out into a 16-ounce water bottle, and after your dog pees, you pour that right on top of the spot where the dog peed. And uh, you'll see the results when I make the video. So there you go. Don't want to disparage that product too much, but 
I wanted you to understand how it is that dog pee damages the lawn so you can mitigate. Really, the most important thing is to water it down. So, all right, let's go to our last one here of the day. This is Dan in Rochester. Hi, Ellen. Dan here in Rochester, New York. Um, I have a kind of two-part question that deals, I guess, uh, both with the, the heat we've been experiencing over the past few weeks. So my first question is, is I've been watering about three times a week um, in doing it, like you said, you know, a deep watering. Um, the thing that I'm wondering is, do you ever bump that up? In particular, the sections of my lawn that are under direct sunlight for most of the day seem to trying to be check out. But um, so I'm wondering, would you recommend maybe watering those spots a little bit more, um, more so than the ones that are that are in the shade a little bit? My second part of my question is, um, I've been noticing some weeds in some of those areas as well. With the heat we've been having, um, I, I'm not confident that I should be using any sort of chemical to, to eliminate those weeds. Is there anything else I can do to get rid of some of those, or do I leave those for now and then worry about those when the temperatures start to come back down? All right, love the podcast. Thank you very much. Bye. All right, Dan, great question. So we got two parts here, watering. So for sure, if you are experiencing a lot of heat and things are starting to get a little bit rough in certain areas, what you want to do is continue with the watering schedule that you're on. This is assuming that the it's not so hot that your grass is literally going brown. Like he's saying, it's just he notices areas that are starting to try to check out. What you want to do is go up from that one half inch, go up to three, four cent, three quarter inch. That's why you time the tuna can challenge at the half inch, because then you can just easily do math and realize what it would take to get three quarter inch or one inch. If it takes you 20 minutes for a certain zone to get down a half inch, then you know you add 10 minutes to that, you should be getting three quarter inch. So I would recommend don't add more days, just add more inches. <laughs> So get down to three quarter inch deeper watering. That should help you. Now, the other thing you can do are these day daytime syringes, these daytime cooling cycles. If you have an irrigation system or you have a way to have a timer, nothing wrong with running the sprinkler for 10 or 15 minutes in the afternoon on the hottest part of the day when it's in the 90s to cool the lawn off. Golf courses do that. Again, it's called syringing. You can look it up. Won't hurt anything. I always have to constantly say this. There's a rumor out there that your lawn will burn if you water it in the middle of the day. That is absolutely false. You guys have all had pop-up thunderstorms hit your lawn on a 90-degree day, and your lawn didn't burn. It happens every day here in Florida. That's about to happen now, and we never have burned lawns. So definitely work on some cooling in the afternoon. But, yeah, for sure, man, if you got areas that are just starting to check out a little bit, go a little bit deeper, Dan, and you'll be all right. Now, weeds. Let's talk about weeds. I know that I scare you guys a lot because I tell you in general, because in general, you shouldn't spray weeds when it's over 85 degrees. The reason I do that is because so many weed controls have an 85 degree temperature restriction on them. And I know that most people don't read labels. So I just say to be safe, just don't spray weeds when it's over 85. By the way, even weed controls that don't have an 85 degree temperature restriction on them, the lawn can still be harmed. There can still be some harm that can come to the lawn. It can still have some damage occur. So that's one of those things you want to think about. However, there are some weed controls you can spray in the summer, but I'm going to say before I go into those and give you those names, I recommend in the summer that you only spot spray. And this is cool season and warm season. I'm going to talk to both of you. Just spot spray. Don't let the summertime be a big weed control time. Do that in the spring and the fall. Just spot spray in the summer. Now, if you're if you're getting crabgrass, you might have to do some pretty heavy shots. But again, still spot or zone spray. So for cool season lawns, if you want to spray something in the summer that does not have an 85 degree temperature recommendation on it, you want to get something that has 2,4-D dicamba and quinclorac in it. Two brand names would be Quincep. That's what I used when I worked for True Green. Or another one would be Triad is kind of the generic. These are fairly affordable for homeowners. You can Google them. Quincep or Triad. 2,4-D dicamba quinclorac. The 2,4-D and the dicamba, those are going to kill most of your broadleaf weeds. They're going to do pretty well on clover. Not going to do so well on the ground ivy and the violet, but they will damage them a little bit through the summer until you can get there to the fall and use something like some triclopyr. But the quinclorac is in there because it kills crabgrass. So now you have a three-way that does really well on most of your summer weeds in cool season grass. Those, uh, the quincep, the triad, it's like 45 bucks for a, a quart. You get it three ounces per thousand is the max rate, so you'll get 10,500 square feet out of it. So 45 bucks to cover 10,500 square feet, but you're mostly going to spot and zone spray. Quincept and Triad, pretty decent, you know, professionally formulated products that you can get 
that'll work well for you in the summer without a heat restriction. Now, if you want a real expensive option because you have massive ground ivy or violet problems, then you want to go for Sure Power. It's a new farm product. Sure Power has 2,4-D, triclopyr, fluoroxapyr, and flamoxazin. Flamoxazin. Yeah, can't pronounce those. But that will smoke the ground ivy and smoke the violets. It'll smoke the clover. Also good on nimblewill, goosegrass, and foxtail, which you're going to see a lot in the summer. But that's an expensive one because it's, I don't think it's off patent yet. So you want to get really crazy, get some sure power. I think it's also probably only available in like 2.5 gallons, which also makes it expensive. And you got to get a lot. For warm season, you can use Celsius. For some reason, I thought Celsius had an 85 degree temperature restriction, but I read the label again before this podcast and I do not see it anywhere. I did have some burn and some zoysia spot spray and some Celsius, but I believe I sprayed a little angry and got a little heavy with it. So Celsius... Now, y'all correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm believing I, I've read the label twice, two different labels, an old one and a new one, and I don't see an 85-degree temperature restriction on Celsius. However, I will tell you, so Celsius can be fine in the summer, just spot spray. I will tell you, though, if you have Centipede or St. Augustine, every weed control that just gets near it will, will damage it. Listen, in the summertime, you can just talk to your St. Augustine and tell it you're going to spray it, and it will get damaged. You don't even have to actually spray it. Just tell the St. Augustine, I'm going to spray weeds tomorrow, and your St. Augustine will show damage, and so will your centipede. It's just how those work. Bermuda, not so much. Zoysia kind of in between, but Celsius is fine for the summer, and you'll be all good on your weed control during the summer. But as I mentioned, I highly recommend that you spot spray. Right with this, Here we go. All right. All right, well, I hope this podcast has been helpful to you. I hope you guys got a little something out of it. I feel like I rushed through it a little bit today, but I feel like we also covered some good techniques, some good strategies. Don't forget to subscribe to The Lawn Care Nut. Got a big video coming out this week, and I'll see you in the lawn.